Thank you for joining us on this edition of The Insight. I am Bable Jonathan. After the government of the Republic of Cameroon has undertaken several initiatives in terms of concessions, dialogue, and military action to solve the crisis in the northwest and southwest regions of the country, the solution seems not to be coming forth anytime soon. Many observers, analysts, critics, crisis resolution experts have been saying that Cameroon must go back to the root cause of the problem. And with the understanding that the root cause of the problem, uh, the roots of the problem are buried in the history of the country, we're going to take a look at the history and we'll look right down deep into the constitution, notably the 1961 federal constitution of the then Federal Republic of Cameroon to see what went wrong and how to right the wrongs for a better future. But first, we are going to analyze some recent happenings in the Northwest and Southwest regions. Stay with us and meet Augustine in a few seconds. Our guest today is Professor Willy Brod Zengwa. He is a historian, political scientist, an expert on or in peace building and conflict management founding president of heritage higher institute for peace and development studies executive director of the african network against illiteracy conflict and human rights abuses and Nikra, and he's a senior peace and conflict analyst and consultant for the new york based center on cooperative security. Professor, thank you for joining us today. Well, it's my pleasure, Babila, to be able to, to share with you as usual. I hope I'm going to make a contribution and nation building. Right, we begin with some recent happenings in the two English-speaking regions of the country within the context of the close to five-year-long armed conflict going on there. Six government workers, delegates, kidnapped in the Southwest region's Indian division. One of them killed five others still in captivity their whereabouts still unknown to the general uh, public several other persons abducted in the northwest region of the country others killed what analysis of these recent happenings well i think it is very regrettable that we are getting to this point and uh, i think that uh, are, these are just signals that the crisis and conflict situation in anglophone cameroon is not going anywhere too soon uh, that uh, we need much more concrete action on the ground to be able to, to, to tackle the grievances of the people. Uh, let me note that as, as, as just late as yesterday or two days ago, we had other people being kidnapped in, in womb. I mean, teachers, uh, council workers, I can even say the Secretary General of the Womb Royal Council, uh, the, the Womb Council. So you, you, we realize that. Uh, with the continuous killings, with the continuous um, extreme tendencies from both sides of the divide. When I say extreme tendencies, I'm talking about the, 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 the excessive force used by the military and of course the extreme uh, violence orchestrated by, by, by the separatists. So we are in a situation where we are not seeing the end of the tunnel too soon. It, it seems as though we are getting from, from a bad to, to a very worse situation. From a bad to a worse situation, and uh, the authorities have been saying that the state is in control, the situation is under control, and people are being kidnapped every day, and state workers, government workers, kidnapped, one killed, and the others in captivity for about a week, and the government or the state that is in control is unable to release them. Let me say they're not one killed. Let me say that the military are being killed as well. And we cannot be talking about uh, being in, in, in control. Uh, controlling what? I, I think this, this is um, very, being very simplistic. The, the realities in the ground is worse than we, 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 we perceive. Uh, permit me to say that I'm a so, foot soldier for peace and regularly in the ground to evaluate what is happening in conflict areas, not only in the Northwest and Southwest regions, but around the country. Uh, let me note that uh, elite of these regions 
cannot go to the regions without going in upward paths, without heavily protected. So is that what we mean by having things under control? Um, I think that the government would have wished to have the things under control, but it is not dependent on the government of the day to determine uh, single-handedly whether things are returning to normalcy or not. It, it needs two to tango. It needs um, the, the, the belligerent forces, uh, I mean the separatist forces, uh, the, the boys in the bushes, and uh, of course the, the government to be able to strike a middle point and agree. And normalcy, to the best of my appreciation, can only come if we have genuine dialogue, if the both sides of the divide actually come out with talking points and sit and talk eyeball to eyeball to pinpoint where the problems are and how they can definitely resolve the problem. So are we, as the government in control? No. I think it's, let's be very fair. Let's not be, let's not be very simplistic because it is true. We have a few areas that we can go to in the southwest regions. Well, maybe Boya, maybe Victoria, Limbe. And even um, in Boya, but for example, there are Boya, still of dangerous course, zones. Now, even in Boya, it is, it is hard to If we talk about the peripheries of Boya, it is still very, very insecure. You get to Boya, uh, to Bermenda, I mean, people are kidnapped by day uh, along Commercial Avenue. Uh, the, the university area is becoming increasingly. It is true that things have died down for a while, but things are picking up in a much more dangerous uh, manner. Uh, and, I con and I think that it is incumbent on, on the peoples of Cameroon to each stop blindfolding the, the downtrodden, to stop blindfolding the, 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 the people who are actually suffering from the strengths of this conflict situation and engage each community in peace building efforts. If not, it, it will be just paper handling of, of the crisis. You, the, the control would have been maybe f to use force, uh, which of course is regrettable. And, and, and let me say that um, we cannot be under control or uh, controlling between six and eight million people who have actually, uh, most of which, or most of whom, have decided to, to either stay mute in inactivity, inactivity or the few who have decided to, to pick up arms against the system. So let me say that it is, it is an ideological issue that all of the guns put together in Cameroon cannot blow off that ideology. So it is, if it is an ideological conflict, it needs soft power to win back the minds and the souls of those who are at war. I believe that is why uh, Senator Bela Mukichans once said that uh, if reconstruction must go on, the minds must be reconstructed first, must uh, change some things at the level of uh, the mindset of uh, those who are uh, actually suffering the consequences. But if we want to look back a little bit, we will see that since 2016, when uh, the crisis started, actually when the violent side of the, the, the issue started because the anglophone problem has been there for as long as decades but now they, it took another twist in 2016 but if we want to look at uh, from 2016 till now we'll see that the government has done a number of things which it considers as solutions to the problem but uh, the problem is still there persisting and even worsening from the time when the government decided to respond to some of the grievances of the teachers and the lawyers by creating, for example, the common law bench at the Supreme Court, the common law department in the national, the, the school of administration and magistracy, and and of course other uh, things like this, which are considered by the state as concessions. Moving right up to the major national dialogue, the putting in place of the regions and the special status and all of these things being done and much money being pumped into these things, but the results not coming forth. Yes, you're, you're very right. Uh, you've put so many things in your question. Uh, l let me come back to talk about the reconstruction before I delve into that. Yes, we have two forms of reconstruction, the hard power reconstruction and the soft power reconstruction. 
I think in the situation in Cameroon, the soft power reconstruction should take the leadership position in terms of dialogue, education, re-education, uh, both the guys on the ground and the government authorities in terms of their actions because there is still continuous action. Now, now let me say that um, as far as what you call, what we consider concessions, I think there, these are absolutely half measures. And if I say half measures, I don't want to say uh, one quarter measures because when we say half measures, it seems as if much has been done. There is, uh, people are being blindfolded to the best of my appreciation. There is no genuine intention to take concrete actions to resolve, to roll back the crisis. Now, I don't know where you want me to begin from. Is it the issue of um, uh, the common law? The the common law right, the common law bench, right. Uh, the, 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 the common, law common department, department in Enam. Yes, it was established that that common law is the department that Enam is going to last for three years. The three years is over. The question is, after the three years, we go back into the mess. So is that putting forth concrete so, uh, solution to, to the cry of a people? Now if we go to the issue of um, major national dialogue, I, I, I just want to say that people were summoned to express their grievances because I took part in that major national dialogue. It was very historical. I'm very proud I took part in that because I saw people who love this country, who love peace, speaking out their minds on how we could go back to normalcy. But after the dialogue, what was the outcome of that dialogue? The system continuously uh, carried on the same principles and the same manner, using the same strategies of, I should say, continual marginalization. So the, 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 that, that, that dialogue was supposed to be between dialogue is not it's not monologue. Dialogue is not between or oh, amongst people who have the same line of thought, and or, or before, who have been compelled to follow the same line. Of thought. Well, in that dialogue, people were not compelled to. People were allowed to talk. We say let sleeping dogs lie, or in French they say le chien aboie, le calavan pass. People were asked to back, but the outcome. What was the outcome? It simply followed the logic of the day, the logic of the system to continuously carry on the same policies in the same manner. Can you tell me one particular policy which has been carried out in another manner? This crisis was caused as a result of, of marginalization, discrimination, attempts at assimilation, uh, reducing of a people to be uh, some sort of less than second class citizens, like photocopied of Cameroonians. Now let's just come back to the recent appointment at Sonora. In, in Limbe, where it's alleged we have nine directors being appointed and we have one who is English speaking. It goes down to the same issue of language. Now let's go to the Northwest and Southwest regions and see uh, the people who are running those, the, the, those areas in terms of uh, administrative officials. L let us go to think about the, the, the budget, I mean uh, the budget for the different areas. Uh, you, you're going to realize that there are some regions which are not up to one, one quarter of either the Northwest or the Southwest regions, but which has the budget that is double the budget of the two regions. So we still have the same tendencies going on, right? So what we're saying is that the dialogue was supposed to have two persons with two different schools of thought with clear talking points to come together and discuss. And, and let me be, be, be glad to note that the President of the Republic was very clear that the dialogue was predominantly to tackle the Anglophone issue. And that is why, in the selection of those who take part in that dialogue, the majority, majority of them from the were, two were, were regions. two English-speaking regions. But unfortunately, the majority of those people from those regions were carefully selected to be almost always from uh, a political thought. And that is why the outcome um, uh, we, we, we can lay blames uh, to say that an opportunity was missed because the head of state constituted Anglophones got a majority of the people from the Northwest and Southwest regions to say, talk about your issue and let's come out with the conclusions. But uh, the final outcome 
we were told that there is um, a special status, uh, which is an outcome of the major national dialogue. Wrong. The, 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 the special status is not an outcome of the major national dialogue. The, the, the special status existed in the 1996 uh, 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 constitution. That constitution clearly stated in its Article 62 that there should be special the regions with special status. I mean, the, 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 the politicians, the parliamentarians, the senators simply failed to activate an existing article in the constitution. So, but it's it the national dialogue that brought it up, and it then is it said not the national dialogue. This should be implemented. It was simply activated. I mean, I should say reactivated. Right. Let us say that that national dialogue caused an article that was existing in our constitution to be activated. But how special is the special status? We still have um, the dominance of uh, a single political party in the northwest and southwest regions. And I am very convinced that the, the politicians from those areas know that they are not representing the wishes of the greatest majority of the people thereupon. And therefore, if we still have uh, uh, um, uh, decent, we, we have, we're talking about decentralization. And in that decentralization, we still have administrative decentralization loading it over political decentralization. We still have the President of the Republic appointing the superfairs, the deals to load it over the elected mayors and parliamentarians. And even we the still independent have, public conciliator. Well, we still have the, 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 the governors, we still have the secretary generals of, uh, of council areas still appointed. Not elect, You've just talked about the, 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 the conciliators. Now, what we are saying is that th there is some sort of window dressing. The concrete actions on the ground is not being implemented. So there is no genuine intention, to the best of my appreciation, to engage in concrete activities which are people-centered. All the activities were supposed to be people-centered, pure democracy. Uh, you, you realize uh, even the elections that took place before the, the, the coming to play of uh, the, the, the regional, regional council. It was not, there were no elections, so to say. The House of Chiefs in the Northwest region, who voted? So people were simply appoint, appointed and applauded. So there is, there is no genuine intention to put the ball back to the population. When you say that there is, there is no genuine intention, what do you make of um, the statements that we have been hearing here and there, uh, bombarding our ears that the head of state has demonstrated political will, has demonstrated beyond any doubt, beyond any reasonable doubt, his political will to solve this problem. I am one of those who think that the president has demo demonstrated some political will by acknowledging that there was an Anglophone problem is the first step towards resolving it. By constituting a, a, a team and acknowledging and even giving prescriptions that there should be a national dialogue with a principal highlight, the Anglophone problem is to show the magnanimity of Mr. Beer to say, I recognize the problem. The problem now is the applicability, the implementation on the ground. The lieutenants whom he has given the powers to do this implementation on the ground. Power positioning. We rather engage in power positioning because we know very well that if we engage in the frank issues in the field, we might not come back as parliamentarians. We might not come back as senators. We might not come back as ministers from our regions because we have lost the, 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 the confidence of the greatest majority of the people. So the blame now is not the head of state, but those who have been given the powers to execute. Let us throw the blame on the Senate. Let us put the blame on the National Assembly. How many times has the National Assembly raised an issue pertaining to the Anglophone problem? How many times has the Senate, even the parliamentarians and senators of the Northwest and Southwest region, shy away? Why? Because the feet fat on the crisis.
those most of, of the, those of the ruling party, of course, those, those of the opposition, those not of the SDF have been pressing for that to no avail. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have and that, was, that was expected to be on the table during the ongoing June session of parliament, but we probably we're yet to get to that. Well, uh, I might differ from your, 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 your style. Um, the, SDF has, the SDF has just been backing and it has become, permit me say, toothless bulldog. Because the SDF was supposed to be very sensitive to the sentiments of the people. And if they did, they would have had real control over the population. But you realize that the SDF has no control in the northwest, the southwest region. It's even regrettable that the chairman of that political party is not even in that region. He's gotten out. So it, it shows some political... Uh, um, he had to move out after he was kidnapped about three times. Well, he, he, he's now out of the region to show that we are not in control. The, the SDF or the politicians, I don't want to limit it to the, to, the, to the SDF, the politicians of the area have become deadly egoistic, self-centered, and they don't think for the interest of the greatest majority of the people. They think only about the contracts that they are going to win and execute. They think only about the projects that they are going to have hundreds of millions to execute when they actually get the money and do not effectively execute these projects on the ground. How can you execute projects, we are talking about reconstruction, without peace, right? I think unless we have both the soft power, we cannot have the hard power reconstruction. And that is why we are saying we, 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 we listened, regrettably, to, to uh, a representative of the Northwest region who came out very strongly to say even the regional council budget could not be debated upon. So we, 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 have, we still maintain the old status quo without injecting some spirit of, of some sort of soft power reconstruction. Soft power reconstruction here would mean for people to change their mentalities, for people to be able to... We, we have often spoken about um, juvenile delinquency, when we want to tack the young children to be delinquent. I think this is, these are clear signs of adult delinquency, because the adulthood, the politicians have decided... I, I should say the intellectuals, everybody has decided to stay mute and watch on things evolve to the, to, 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 to the worst. Uh, of course, for fear of intimidation, because we cannot be able to speak the truth. It is only the truth that can so some Some spoke Rome. the truth, and at the end of the day, they had to escape, or, or some spoke out, because oh, it may not be considered as the truth by some other people. Uh, people like Honorable Weber, Joseph, they spoke out courageously in Parliament, and now they are in exile. He's I, an exile. I'm glad you said some, but you did not say some spoke out and they are still in Cameroon. We, 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 you changed the strategies. Let us be able to say that um, there is no Cameroonian who is photocopied. There is no Cameroonian who is more authentic than another. And in a body, in a whole body, you cannot be at peace if you have a finger which is at pain. You cannot be at peace when you, an eye, one of your eyes is paining. So if a segment of the country is in total crisis, in a war situation, where we cannot be able to go home for several years, then we should not say that things are in control, that we are getting to normalcy when things are degenerating. It needs the intellectual class who are not simply waiting for appointments to be able to come forth and think about the interests of the greatest majority of the people. It is incumbent on all the politicians, irrespective of political parties, not to maintain the belly politics, where they think only about themselves and their immediate families, while the masses suffer in, 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 in abject poverty and in misery and, and in all what it takes when it comes to the conflict situation in the Northwest and Southwest regions. Yes, we might have had some good intentions. Somebody said, uh, the President of the Republic might have very good intentions to get to a return to normalcy, 
but the strategies used to attain the normalcy might not be the best strategies. And On the can... other hand, the separatists also have a genuine reason to complain, but the strategies that they are using might not be the best strategies to attain their desires. So the both sides might not be, have genuine reasons, genuine intentions, but the strategies might not be a great strategies to attain an acceptable, peaceful situation. And to the best of my appreciation, we need peace which must be weaved around social justice. We need peace which is the consequence of concrete actions carried on on the ground to roll back conflict situations. I think that is the only tendency. And in this light, pride should be thrown to the dogs. And Cameroonians should be able to embrace one another, embracing even if, if we do not agree, and be able to reduce negative name-calling, to be able to underline where the problem is, and objectively and dispassionately come out with concrete solutions that should satisfy the greatest majority of not only the people of the Northwest and Southwest regions, but Cameroonians as a whole. Elsewhere, in other African countries, we have seen uh, leaders who are in power sitting down with the rebels to discuss. But that seems to be a near impossibility in Cameroon. Well, um, let us see pride comes with a fall. Uh, there's a lot of pride and arrogance with the governance system of Cameroon, very regrettably, um, that the questions have always been, with whom are we going to dialogue with? Initially, uh, who are they? Uh, it moved on gradually. Uh, we are going to talk with Anglophones, but before talking with them, we must be sure that they are ours. Ours would mean those who have been appointed, um, whom my, 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 my dear uh, elder brother, uh, Tumfo Barisa Nikohale, referred to as bootlickers. Um, we have to get only those ones to talk on behalf of the people. Wrong. We think that it is absolutely necessary to engage in dialogue. People have said uh, the dialogue should be without preconditions. I am one of those who think that the dialogue should be with conditions. One condition. What conditions? Before the dialogue, the only condition I think that should be imposed is that the Anglophones should be able to meet amongst themselves and democratically choose those who can properly articulate their grievances. That is the only way that we can be able to. Because on the other part, it is very easy to constitute a team from, from the government, from the government position to dialogue with, with, with the Anglophone community. But it is not easy to constitute those Anglophones because they are as divided. That is one of the, the, the greatest headache of the crisis. But if we had to say as a condition, international partners, uh, those on the diaspora, the those at home, the mediator, get the Anglophone, have another all-Anglophone conference, select those who will properly articulate, announce to the world that these are the people we have selected to properly arti articulate the grievances of the Anglophones. There and then can we actually have people speaking on behalf of those Anglophones. Failure to wish the government or people are just going to spring up. The government is going to select Anglophones, but who do not are not really having the con true, true conviction. Let, let, let me say something. Um, every single Anglophone. By Anglophone, I mean somebody who originates from that part of the country which lived under British colonial administration. Anglophone to me would mean those from the Northwest and Southwest regions. Not English speakers. Not English speakers. English speakers 
who come from other regions, I call them Anglophiles, those who have fallen in love with the English language and culture and have a Francophone background or other backgrounds that have fallen in love and engaged in that. So if I say Anglophones, I'm talking about the Southern Cameroons, people who originate from the Northwest and Southwest region. I want to say that there is no, even those who are top ministers might only be pretentious when they speak overtly. But covertly, they are going to always complain about marginalization, discrimination. So what I'm struggling to say is that it is a genuine concern which needs a lot of tact to, to, to be implemented, to be applied in order to de-radicalize. All the Anglophones, the difference is that the manifestations are different. The degree of complaints, some complain and keep quiet. Of course, they have been appointed. Others complain and speak out. Others complain and pack their bags and baggages and their families and leave the country. Others have spoken. Others are in the bushes. Others have decided to pick up arms. So, there is a genuine reason for Cameroonians, or they have a genuine, uh, they have genuine grievances. And I think that the time is now more than ever before for, 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 for Cameroonians, for the governance system to say, we had wrong, we went wrong here. And we can correct this by actually opening up and accepting to talk, to engage in fair, frank, firm, dialogue. and friendly dialogue. Something that such a dialogue, which is expected to bring on board the secessionist leaders, uh, the ones who have been recognized because there are also uh, issues within the ranks of the uh, non state armed group fighters with. Lots of lead, so many leaders coming up here and there and so on. That is, uh, they should be brought on the table on a neutral ground. That is exactly sure. what I meant when I said that the dialogue should have a condition. We should not just open up. We want to dialogue with Anglophones. Everybody, you, people who spring up and say we speak for the Anglophones. That is why I say that the Anglophones, those who come from the Northwest and Southwest regions, it call them political, together. the elite, whatever elite, uh, those in government those without the government, those out of the country, the ones you call secessionists or restorationists, they should come together in a neutral ground and actually brainstorm, articulate their problems very clearly and elect democratically those they think can properly uh, articulate uh, their problems. That, it will be only in that way, to my appreciation, that we are going to reduce some of the the, the extremist leadership positions or the emerging leadership position on a daily basis. Uh, we can be able to put a hold to that because we don't actually know who the leader is. But I think that in order to do that, uh, there is no reason why any single of the, the, the separatist fighters uh, in, 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 in jail. Uh, the reason might have been that they, they committed some crimes but I think that um, if we want to talk peace, we must be forgiving. And thank God, the, the, the President of the Republic in uh, creating the, the DDR, the Disarmament, Demobilization and Reintegration um, Commission, actually noted that the government is willing to forgive those who put down their guns. Talk. So they should be willing also to forgive. So those they should who are be willing prison. to forgive all those who are in prison. Let the the, the, the guys in prison, let Seseko and his team be freed. Let all those who have been arrested and locked up in connection with the crisis be freed, and then an olive branch be extended for dialogue. And dialogue should be. I implore what I call my five, five or four Fs. The dialogue must be very fair, getting people actually select those to represent them. It should be frank dialogue, which means that we should get back to the root causes of, of, of the, the, the crisis. How did we get here? It should be firm, I mean, firm. 
on both sides of the divide, taking decisions irrespective of who it hurts. And of course, in a friendly atmosphere. If we adopt such a dialogue with well-defined talking points, we should have the talking points and the delegates to this dialogue and the intention, the outcome of the dialogue should be a pacifier to both sides of the divide. It should be acceptable, no matter the outcome. Whether the outcome is separation, whether the outcome is a 10-state federation, whether it is a 2-state federation, whether it is a 4-state federation, whether it is a 58-state federation based on the present divisions, it should be the wishes of the greatest majority of the peoples of Cameroon. And should be accepted by all. It should be accepted. I, I take on the second F, frankness. It should be frank. And you indicated that the root causes of the problem must be put on the table and properly examined and right decisions taken. And that's why we want to go deep into the Constitution to look at what exactly went wrong with the uh, 1961 federal constitution what went wrong there and how that can be corrected for a return to normalcy to be expected we'll do that after the press review immaculate for it takes us to the press or the news stands and we're going to see what the newspapers reported this week The Scoop reports separatist fighters brutally slaughter kidnapped divisional delegate in Dian Division, Southwest Region. News Watch says non Dian youth mercenaries are behind the kidnap of divisional delegates. Municipal updates states that Dian youths rise up against the recent kidnapping of six divisional delegates. The Chronicle Times kidnap of six delegates sucking separatist interim government claims responsibility. Cameroon echoes Dian chiefs disavow separatists for abducting six divisional delegates and killing one. The star separatist movements in Cameroon and Nigeria joining forces. The Guardian Post Separatist fighters kill six soldiers in Guti, southwest region, and Bamali, northwest region. In depth news, quotes the fawn of Gabo. Separatist fighters have never killed anyone in Gabo. The median, Yaounde military court suspects of the Gabo massacre say they are not guilty. The reporter, armed conflict in the northwest and southwest regions. Government accuses doctors without borders of financing terrorism. The post, African Development Bank loans Cameroon 106 billion francs CFA for the construction of the Bamenda Ring Road project. Breaking news questions if General Express is a slaughterhouse or travel agency. Another edition of the Garden Post says drama in court's house in Bamenda. PCC Christian stage street protest over pastor's transfer. The horizon exclaims sexual abuse on 18-year-old. Government condemns despicable act. You're welcome back. Thank you, Immaculate Fogwe, for the press review. We're still with our guest, our guest today, Professor Willy Brot Zengwa, historian, political scientist, and expert in peace building and conflict management. Professor, what went wrong with the constitution of the country, the 1961 constitution? Well, the story has been told uh, many a times, and uh, people already mastered that. But it is always important to come back to it. And I'm glad you, you capitalize on the second F, Frank. It is incumbent for Cameroonians to be frank. The peoples of the Northwest and Southwest regions of Cameroon did not just get up one day to say we want to go. Um, it has moved on and on. And I know you know that that has, that has been my concern, my research area for close to to 23, 24 years. My master's degree dissertation, which I defended in 1997, 
was entitled The Anglophone Problem in Cameroon, a Historical Perspective from 1916 to 1995. And we delved on to a PhD which we titled National Unity and National Integration in Cameroon, Dreams and Realities, where we again highlighted the, the conflict regions of Cameroon, particularly the Anglophone crisis. So we had projected that and we had indicated early warning signals uh, many years back to say if this we see a crisis coming, this are the mani uh, these are the causes, these are the manifestations. If we do not check it on time, it might degenerate. We have reached at a level where the crisis has is escalated. Now, what was the what 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 was the causes? I mean, the root cause. Let us be very clear. People have always come often and said that Cameroon is, was one and indivisible. It was created by the Germans, and that well, I don't want to go into those histories. Those are not facts. Because Cameroon has never been one. Which Cameroon? You see, we don't want to go into the polemics of which Cameroon. Because if we want to take out, think about the German Cameroon, we are going to be thinking about portions of Cameroon in Nigeria, portions of Cameroon in Chad, in Gabon, in Central African Republic, in Equatorial Guinea. So we should not go into those polemics. But what we want to say is that Cameroon is a nation of special creation. I mean, contemporary Cameroon. The Cameroon we are living in today is a creation, uh, it's a special creation created by the willingness of the different nations of Cameroon, the very different ethnic groups of Cameroon, the different peoples of Cameroon to come together and live in concord and harmony. So it was created by the will of the people to come together through reunification. And to talk reunification, we are saying that the peoples who came together were two, two entities two governments which had lived under two colonial experiences who spoke two different languages English and French which had two educational systems two legal systems we can even say two anthems so to bring together these people with such diversities was incumbent the willingness of the leadership whom we call today the founding fathers of the country thought it was nice to come together based on a federal status quo. That gave birth to the federal constitution. Let me note that before the federal constitution, La République du Cameroon, the French part of Cameroon, that is the eight other regions of Cameroon, had achieved independence on the 1st of, uh, uh, of January 1960. 1960. 1960. 1st January 1960. We are talking about the eight Francophone regions. It was known as the Republic of Cameroon. It was not, the Anglophones part were not part of that independence. The two regions attained their own independence by reunifying with the Republic of Cameroon on the 1st of October 1961. 1961. These two entities decided to come together and effectively adopted a federal constitution. Very clearly. Article 1 was clear. Let me say, there was La Republic du Cameroon and there was Southern, Southern Cameroon. Cameroon. All had their governments, they had their prime ministers, they had their territory, they had their peoples, they had their languages different, they had their culture which were different. They agreed to come together. But Article 1 was very clear. On coming together, we have to forget about our original names. Article 1 is very clear that the Federal Republic of Cameroon will be constituted by that territory which was formerly referred to as the Republic of Cameroon and that territory which was formerly referred to as Southern Cameroon. The two would come together to become the Federal Republic of Cameroon and the Republic of Cameroon will become East Cameroon while the Southern Cameroons will become West Cameroon. So we had two entities with two flags, I mean two, two stars on the green flag to indicate that two peoples had come together in a federal status quo. So that article is very important. And the names? The names were very important. Were dropped? Were, were dropped. La Republic du Cameroon? Yes, and, and Southern Cameroon. Southern Cameroon. Yes, they were dropped at that point. If I have to run fast to say if we are bearing the name La Republic du Cameroon today, 
two things should have happened. Either the majority would have assimilated the minority Anglophone Cameroon to their Republic to Cameroon, or they would have seceded from the federal status quo. That is the, one of the arguments. It's an argument of history. Article 18 of the federal constitution was very clear that before a law was promulgated, the, the, the President of the Republic would request for a second reading, uh, either on his own or through the Prime Ministers of the Federated States. But it was very clear that before any law was ad uh, adopted, there was supposed to be a majority of voters in the two houses of assembly. West Cameroon at the time had 10 deputies. East Cameroon had 40 deputies. So it meant that before a law should be promulgated, there was supposed to be six Anglophones who voted and 21 from the East Cameroon. East Cameroon. This made it very clear that the majority could not impose on the minority. By interpretation, even if the majority, 40 deputies of East Cameroon, wanted a decision to be implemented, wanted to promulgate the law, even if five West Cameroon parliamentarians rejected to the option, it could not be implemented. That Article 18 protected the minority position of the West, Cameroon West Cameroonians at that time. But later on, of course, before 19, by 1961, I mean 1971, 1972, uh, that article was simply modified and scraped in order to give way for a simple majority, uh, which meant that if, 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 if all the 10 parliamentarians from, from West Cameroon were against a decision, it could still be imposed on them if a majority from, from East Cameroon voted into that. And this was played very simply with Article 47. Article 47 was very clear. When the, 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 the law was abrogated, uh, Article, Article 18, it made it easy for Article 47 to be, to be, to be, to be checked and erased. Article 47 was very clear that no decision which was to impair the federal status quo of the country should be implemented. Any decision, no modification of the constitution should impair the federal status quo. By my interpretation, bring out any reform in the constitution, but the federal status quo should not be violated. But of course, by 1972, that article was violated. Cameroon moved from the Federation to the United Republic and systematically from the Re United Republic to the Republic. Now, this were, these are, are, are historical truisms, frank facts, which um, has been some of the, the root causes. And let me say that the changing of those, of those uh, constitution is not really the matter. It is the implementations of policies and activities and reforms which went with them, systematically reducing the powers of West Cameroon, not only West Cameroon, but we are talking West and East Cameroon, systematically reducing the powers of West Cameroon into the center and gradually reducing the powers of the other regions to the center, Centralized. centralizing the power of the executive. Um, that has been the, 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 the reason. But when we talk to Anglophone Cameroon, I don't want to go back to the issues of marginalization, to the issues of discrimination, to the issues of the common law, to the issues of the education system, to the issues of poor representation, to the issues of um, uh, the least developed in terms of uh, uh, national budget should, should be uh, those regions. Um, that is it. So we have gone on. All the companies, the, the sea, deep sea port, the airlines, the roads which had been constructed became non-existent. There were transfers, 
it will be glad for you to know, historically, that at one point in time, uh, in order to lure civil servants from, from, from West Cameroon to, to move over and work in East Cameroon, we had salary discrepancies. The civil servants in East Cameroon and more than civil servants from, from West Cameroon, we were in the same country. So different strategies were, were being implemented. Uh, uh, the, the Fonade, we talk about the former, Farmers Bank, whose head office was created, constructed, far away from the base of the people. I mean, Fonade was supposed to be uh, a farmer's bank, and predominantly we had farmers of Anglophone Cameroon who invested in that. Sonora had to be paying its taxes, not in Victoria, but, but, in, but in Douala, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, uh, so this discrimination, this, these policies, the change of name, to me, did not very much matter. But it is what went with the change of name in terms of policies. Then he got to a position where, of course, people were made to understand that the, the, the Anglophones or well, 20 percent of the population wrong. Uh, the Anglophones are 20 percent of the population. If, if we just want to, to do a small statistics, let's say that at the time of reunification, West Cameroon or Southern Cameroon had 800,000. Uh, people while francophone Cameroon had three thousand uh, two hundred uh, people now if you multiply by five you realize that it is not two uh, twenty percent percent eight hundred thousand is not twenty percent of and if we have grown to that light then we will not be talking about twenty percent it should be about thirty percent so reducing 30% of the population and selecting just a few of them to give them some semi-key positions um, cause a clear manifestation of marginalization. Now some historians like um, Gilbert Gimdor, for example, see um, the violation of uh, or the changes brought to the 1961 federal constitution which you just highlighted earlier as uh, a deliberate plan to absorb or better still to assimilate the, the minority do you see it as such i just said so i said it is not just those policies which it's a deliberate plan it's a deliberate plan deliberate plan because the actions moved on systematically systematically uh, uh, if you permit i quote the head of state in one of his interviews in France, in when he was Paris in Peace Paris Peace Summit. Summit, interviewed by Mo Ebrahim, he was very clear. We had tried to assimilate the people and failed. Right. So it was a careful plan. Systematically. Reducing the people. Uh, somebody argues, if you like, um, Abe Muka, and argued that the Northwest and the Southwest regions were used as grounds to create employment for the people, the greatest majority of Francophones. Because at one point, nearly all the senior divisional officers, the governors, the delegates, the whatsoever who had some authority spoke French. And they did not have the humility, or most did not have the humility um, to learn English, uh, yes, English, and share English language with the people. There was the language of arrogance, the language of authority, the language uh, of fringe, which the Constitution of 1961 even stated that in terms when there was translation, the French version was authentic to give right to the people to think that French language and its speakers were superior to English language and its speakers as far as Cameroon is concerned. But it is true that we've gone through evolution and we think that unless we, we go to the, back to the injustices, I don't want to say that which had been committed. I want to say that these injustices still prevail up till date. And I have run first to say, I think it shouldn't be the, only the handiwork of the President of the Republic. He has manifested goodwill. 
Let us get to the different ministerial departments and see how the different ministers and the public figures uh, uh, handle the 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 discriminate the, uh, the issue of discrimination, marginalization, and uh, imposition of the the, 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 the the French language on a people. Let's see it at the individual level, at the different ministerial levels. I, I, I see some big companies and ministries say they have reserved a, once a week to the English language. That is a continuation of the discrimination. They might think that they're doing some fellow. In why, seven why, days. Why, why do you speak in, English uh, once a week? In your, you, you still continue to impose that pride of one language and the people over the other. So we, we are saying that... Um, we need soft power, and that soft power, we need education, re-education. All of these things have gone off because of impunity. And let me take you a little bit one step back or to expand a little more on the aspect of um, the federal system that was abolished. How did that uh, take us to where we are now? The abolition of the federal structure in violation of the 1961 federal constitution. Well, I, I think that is where I, I might, I might uh, vindicate the, the leadership at the time. Uh, let me say that it was, this was a common phenomenon in, in all third world countries. Uh, centralized powers. Uh, at independence, most African countries adopted policy options, national unity, national integration, uh, Ubuntu, familyhood, and all of that. And with, 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 with the aftermath of decolonization, we moved on to new colon, uh, uh, colonization, where the former colonial masters wanted to have some kingpins. They wanted to declare some sort of political independence, but hold back economic independence. In order to hold back this economic independence, they needed to have leaders, I call them dictators. So almost all African leaders at the time were dictators who wanted to concentrate powers in their hands. So Ahijo was just doing what other African leaders were doing, struggling to consolidate power. Let me note that British Southern Cameroons was the first country in Africa to manifest exemplary democracy, whereupon an opposition candidate actually won and the incumbent handed power peacefully and returned to the opposition. That's the first country, the first territory in Africa. Now, it was alarmist as far as Africa is concerned. And, of course, people had to question. Ahijo had to do his best to eject from his government all those whom he considered as federalists. Federalists were those who wanted to maintain the federal status quo at all costs. He replaced all of them in his government and replaced them with unitarist, those who saw with him, those who accepted, well, it was politics. Politics is coining policies to gain power and govern people. The politicians at the time coined their own policies to gain their own power. We are talking about the unitarist, the Munas. So they had to adhere to the unitarist doctrine and they, had, they were given the opportunity to replace the, 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 the Federalists. And systematically, it moved on to 1971 and then 1972 when um, the famous question was asked whether Cameroonians would want a strong, united, economically viable. In short, the question was posed in such a way that nobody could say no because there's nobody who wants disorder. There's nobody who wants to live in poverty. And people had to vote on the 20th of May. Let me put it this way. We are talking facts. Let us note that the voting, there was no choice because we are told that it was 99.9999%. Yes, because everybody was compelled to vote. People had to carry along their, 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 their voter's cards as some tax tickets in order not to be uh, arrested during Kalikali. So it was a matter of everybody must vote. And people voted. Yeah, without having a choice. The question was clear. But no sooner had the vote... Many probably voted against their will. Of course, people voted against their will. And, of course, if you read The Prisoner Without a Crime, 
you will know about uh, 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 Albert Muko and his peers and what they went through. Immediately after that, people started protesting. But uh, we moved on. Uh, the constitution stated that the president and vice president should not come from the same, from the same uh, ethnic group, from the same region, from the same state. But by 19, um, uh, we, we can say 75, the president and vice president uh, came from the same area. We can say from Franco, from Cameroon, from East Cameroon. That was again against the constitution. So we moved on and on, and power got consolidated. So like you said, we moved on, and by 1984, um, it, it dawned on the, the leadership that it was that attained a level where the people would not protest. So we simply changed the name of the country to the Republic of Cameroon. And let me say that... Which goes back to the name... Back to the name of the... The, 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 the French-speaking part. The, the, that the territory... Uh, which attained independence in 1960. 1960. And let me note uh, very clearly that uh, the declaration of, of independence by the famous or infamous Ambazonia is not the first time. Uh, facts be told, the SCNC had been the, the, we, 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 we can say that uh, officially the independence has been declared thrice. The first time by, by immediately after the, the country was renamed. By 1985, Gorgi Dinka, uh, in his new social order, uh, called on the creation of Ambazonia and actually highlighted that the Republic of Cameroon had seceded. That is, that territory which achieved independence in 19, uh, 1st January 1960 had seceded and he was announcing the creation of Ambazonia. So that was the first time the independence of that territory was declared. He lives in Nigeria. The second time was um, around 1999, on December, when a certain chief judge uh, 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 stormed the radio station of Boya and declared the independence. So this is the, the, the latest declaration of independence in 2017. is the third official proclamation of independence. Because of um, what is called marginalization, uh, attempted assimilation, discrimination, reducing of a people to be some sort of photocopied of the original Cameroonians. Right. We're going to take some interviews now. And when we come back, we'll take a look at how to right the wrongs. It's a sad situation that um, kidnapping is now being used as a tool of war. And not only that um, they were kidnapped, but I saw the video of one of them who was beheaded. That's very unfortunate. It's a very barbaric um, situation. Um, for those who are not involved in active hostility, they are not supposed to be a target. But I think also that we should be honest, honest enough to ask ourselves, how did we get here? These were peaceful protesters who started in 2016 and 2017, and that has morphed into an armed struggle because of the attitude of government. So it's incumbent on government to try to find a solution, to talk to those who have taken up arms against the state in a very genuine kind of discussion or dialogue, and to address some of the fundamental issues. And I believe that um, a solution could come from having a federation in this country. I don't see why it's a taboo. I don't see why they are scared. I read the other day that um, the Minister of Higher Education, who is also communication guy of the, of the CPDM, was saying that the CPDM is not... Um, now is ready to talk about the uh, federation. I don't know what I got him what. So I think these are things that we need to address um, because whoever is being killed in the conflict is a Cameroonian. The country loses and the government owes a duty to protect the civilian population. So whatever is going on, we, the government is responsible to ensure that we put an end to this. I am not happy because with this con, I feed my children off with. Since yesterday, I buy this con and plum. The, the plum is rotting. I, they have not given us space to stay. We used to stay normally behind the toilet there, but we are not able. Now if we look at my little girl, she is here helping me just to say touch her because we want to feed her. Then the way the community are treating us just as, as if we are not Cameroonians. So the thing is it's very painful. I want to use this opportunity to inform the population around the Douala uh, 
It's fair to, to be very uh, vigilant and to cooperate with the police, give us the right information that will help us to make sure that we fight against uh, these criminal uh, activities and the sale of uh, drugs. Thanks for staying with us, Professor Willy Brot Zengwa. How to right the wrongs. Where we are today, uh, there are things that need to be put right in order to be able to change the future. There are probably things in the past. History cannot be changed. You will agree with me that history cannot be changed. We can't change what past, but we can change the present and the future. So how to right these wrongs that we just talked about in the Constitution? I, I think a uh, very interesting question. How do we right the wrongs? Yes, the, 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 the wrongs have been exacted. Uh, righting the wrongs, the first thing is to acknowledge that the wrongs actually were wrong. We accept that there is a genuine problem that these people are putting forth. We get the humility to acknowledge that the President of the Republic acknowledged that. We have talking, we, we, we've spoken about that. That is why there was a major national dialogue. Um, the different Cameroonians in their different powerful and less powerful positions should actually follow suit. Because anybody who is re refuting the genuine existence of the Anglophone problem is not against the president's goodwill of handling the problem, but it's against humanity as a whole, because the problem is genuine. If we accept it, that's fine. The next thing is, come, let us talk. And that's what seems to be... Uh a little bit difficult. First of all, accepting it because even those who are close to the President of the Republic today are still uh, trying to convince Cameroonians that the move from the federal structure to a unitary structure uh, was good because the President at the time saw that the federal structure was too costly, the highlighting points like this was not really good for the country at that time, and so it was profitable. For us to have what we have now, a unitary, decentralized uh, system. Uh, Babila, uh, that is an intriguing question. If the reason for abolishing the federal status quo is that it was expensive, yes, that was the argument at the time. Because we had four houses of assembly, the National House of Assembly, the Federal House of Assembly, the East Cameroon House of Assembly, the West Cameroon House of Assembly, the, the, the House of Chiefs. Yes, that was the argument at that time. If that was the argument at that time, and it was any genuine reason, to dissolve the federal status quo, that is the most important same reason why we should dismember the centralized status quo that we have today. Because today, it has become far more expensive than the four houses of assemblies. We have the National Assembly, we have the Senate, we have 10 regional assemblies, we have the House of Chiefs. Which one is more expensive? Each with budget. So we are several times more expensive with several more institutions than the federal status quo. So it is incumbent. If that logic of expensive, uh, the, the logic that the federal status quo was expensive, then the current status quo is far more expensive and we don't need this is the current status quo where we have all the regional delegates with all the expenditures. We want effective decentralization. Right. Where, After because we don't, we don't have only, uh, maybe I, I did not make my point very clear. We don't have only the federal, uh, the, the, the regional councils and the regional chairs, 10, but we have regional governors to make 20. So which is more expensive? The DOs, the, the SDOs. The DOs are there, the SDOs. We have 10 governors, we have 10 uh, uh, regional presidents. But at that time, we had just four. It was dissolved. Now we have more than 20 top, including uh, the National Assembly, uh, the, 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 Senate. the Senate. So it goes to 22 houses that should be dissolved. 
Right. So after acknowledging the wrongs, what's the next step? After acknowledging the wrongs, we have to be humble enough to ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean that you must say, oh, I'm very sorry, we wronged you. No. Forgiveness can be done another way. Just say, can you come and we talk? Not talking on your basis, on your points, but putting the points on the table. What really are your grievances? Sit, constitute yourselves. Come out with the clear points that you have. Everybody knows the grievances of the Anglophones now. Is there any genuine reason, uh, genuine intentions to solve those problems? That is the question. In the dialogue, people should be able to, 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 I mean, give in, conciliation. People should be able to, to, to understand the, the tendency, the viewpoint of each other and accept, come to a point of mutual understanding. I did say that if the outcome of that discussion is going to satisfy the greatest majority of the people, let that be. What, if the outcome, the outcome is that we should adopt a federal status quo, which is two state, four state federation, ten state federation, fifty eight state federation, as per the current regions, let that be. At worst, if there can be separation and the two entities live as brotherly neighbors, friendly neighbors within the pan-african tendency it will still be fair but it is the people who should decipher who should determine what system of governance they want to live under it should be a bottom top top approach in the system of governance standard good simply good governance uh, strategies Everybody should be allowed to speak. Even the secessionists, in that dialogue, each person should be struggling to convince the other. You can con convince the, sim the, the secessionists, hey, don't talk about secession. To the, the, if we, are, we remain big one, we, we might benefit from one another. But these are the concessions we are going to make. So each person is supposed to be ready to make concessions. We should not say there should be no talking points. Uh, there are certain things which should be taboo subjects. There shouldn't be taboo subjects in that dialogue. But before the dialogue, in that sign of conciliation, in that sign of forgiveness, all those who are found guilty, uh, is it, have they been found guilty? Who have been condemned, who are in prison? Siseko and Co. The others, all those who are locked up, should be released. There should be a general amnesty. General amnesty. All those who have... The, the general amnesty will be from... There should be, I should say, um, commission for reconciliation. Peace and reconciliation. Where people should come out freely and express themselves of what crimes they've committed and seek for, for forgiveness and healed trauma healing, the experts in trauma healing can heal some of those people. Those in the diaspora should not bring them home, even if they want the dialogue to take place in a neutral ground. Allow them. General amnesty. I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that if the President of the Republic uh, came up today to say I'm going to grant general amnesty, all those who are uh, accused or related to the Anglophone crisis or secessionists, we are forgiven you. We are forgiving you if you are going to, to come back and uh, we build the country uh, together. If the others are released, if the third degree military in the field are withdrawn, I mean, then we can be talking about cessation of hostilities. If we move from one stage to another, the, 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 the common man is going to see the goodwill of the government, not only power, poli uh, not only paper policies, because most of what has been going on in Cameroon now has been paper policies, again by the same elite. The same parliamentarians are the same contractors who are going to execute the contracts in the ground. They are the same peace builders who are going to go to the ground. They are the same everything. The 
they are the same. So, one minister is a businessman, he's everything. He's, so, you realize that um, I have a conviction that there are some people who just feed fat from the crisis and will not want it to go. But then, if we have cessation of hostilities by bringing back the third degree military, I mean the expertise of military, and use the same military, I have said this many times, the Cameroon military is some very experienced and professional, but not in the light of the killings in the field. Professional in the sense that many a Cameroonian soldier has served as a UN peacekeeper. Many of them are medical doctors, nurses. Many of them are engineers. Many of them have acquired knowledge that can be transmitted to the local population. So my take is that these experts in the military could be used because they are experts in peace building operations. They can deploy this in the field and withdraw the third degree military whose only language they understand is force and victory. Shooting. We have been seeing some civil or military activities going on in the two English-speaking regions. Some of the soldiers bringing medication to the population, uh, trying to build some bridges, fix some uh, roads here and there, and so on. But the, the, there's an issue of trust. There's an issue of trust. Because uh, when you talk, for example, about assuring the people out there that Mark Barita, if you come home, yeah, but you, if you come home, Dr. Sako, if you come home, you're going to go back free. After disagreeing with the Aounde administration, uh, there's a big issue there. The, the big issue is, comes from up. What has been the declarations? If the declaration comes from up that we are forgiving you, there is general amnesty. From the President of the Republic. From the President of the Republic. And we are withdrawing the third degree military from the field. We are instead redeploying peacemakers. And people are seeing. It is true that with the military uh, might be doing some great job in the field. They might be doing a few things in the field. But let it be done, not by the third degree military, the third degree soldiers, but by people who have received training to do that. The road construction, we have the Genie Militaire, who have experts who can construct. They can rebuild some of the schools, some of the villages which have been destroyed. If there is a civil military. If we have to rebuild confidence between the population and these professional military that I'm talking about, the teachers, the medical doctors, the civil engineers and all of that, this could be redeployed in those areas to be able to build peace. If this begins and the international community and the national community and the, the separatists realize that the, 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 there is a withdrawal of, of the third degree military. They will not see any reason with whom are they going to be fighting. They might also put down their guns in preparation for genuine dialogue. That's if actually uh, there is acceptance. The acceptance, on, the recognition, on, 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 on the protection of the other. On both sides. Of both sides of the divide. Acceptance to lay down some uh, things and then move gradually towards the center and try to reach a point of compromise. Because as of now, people are at extremes saying, we can drop our guns until we get our country. Yes. And the other side to say is, we can allow can talk one. You. No, and we cannot allow one millimeter of our territories with you. We cannot even talk with you because you are a terrorist. So we are at two extreme positions. But let me say something. As far as the dialogue is concerned, come, let's talk. Experience has shown through history. We are talking the facts. Histo uh, experience has shown through, uh, throughout history that since independence, there has never been any genuine dialogue among Cameroonians. Since independence. We can list them. 1961. There was no genuine, genuine dialogue at Fumban. One side imposed on another. But let us say that the outcome was a very valuable document. The outcome. I'm one of those who praised the Fonchas, the Munas, the Indeles for having 
assisted in coming out with the federal constitution. You know why? Because many years after, the greatest intellectuals, the greatest law experts, legal experts, have said, let us go back to that constitution of 1961. If we are going back to that constitution, it means that we have certain articles that protected the minority situation of the Anglophones. Article 1, Article 9. We talked about Article 9, Article 18, Article 47. Great. But the point is that it was later on abused because the international community were not represented. We can move fast to talk about the, the, the tripartite conference. The tripartite conference, you, you know that most of the top anglophone leaders walked out of the tripartite. Most of those who were speaking on behalf of the anglophones walked out of the tripartite because their values were not represented. I want you to, 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 to remember that it was the, fed, the, 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 the current constitution is an outcome of the evolution of activities after the tripartite, where the Anglophone community duly constituted themselves and proposed a constitution that was thrown out. No genuine dialogue. We are talking about the current uh, 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 national the dialogue. National the dialogue, national 2019. 2019. It was not genuine dialogue. So, history teaches us that states have collapsed that states have disintegrated because they have failed to learn from history. And if we learn from history and see what is happening in other countries, and we realize that in Cameroon we have not been able to have a genuine dialogue, the dialogue we are referring to, we are employing this time around, should have international or national independent personalities who should ensure that the outcome of any dialogue should be religiously implemented. And since should meet the aspirations, of, meet the the aspirations of the people, if we say this is what we are going to do, this is what we are going to do, it has to be religiously implemented. implemented. So that's why we think that in that dialogue, we need international experts. And let's just say, preferably, the United Nations, because the United Nations seem to have not completed, had engaged on an uncompleted mission by not respecting its resolution 1608. Even though there are still some today who do not trust even that United Nations looking at, looking into history at the we and yes question at, uh, during the plebiscite, which was administered by the same UN, we and yes. I think we have a council of the wise in Africa. Um, we can get some of those wise people, uh, the former heads of states, who have been democratically voted and through democracy they respected their term limits. We have many of them across Africa. Good luck, Jonathan of we Nigeria. Can get, we can get... You, you push me to say that the Bakasi crisis was handled by, by, by Africans. I've often joked over that, but it's very serious. He needed a beer, a, uh, the former president of Nigeria, Basanjo, Basanjo and an African uh, Secretary General of the United Nations to come out with a green tree accord. So Africans can sign an effective peace deal. In the same light, Abbas Onjo is on. Uh, some of the good luck Jonathans, some of the former presidents who have, are embodiment of democracy. Why not the more Ibrahims could be brought in to chair this workshop or this uh, dialogue and ensure that the outcome will be implemented by some transitional government? In that dialogue, I think that uh, the, uh, one of the outcomes of that dialogue should, should, should be a transitional government. Uh, a transitional government chosen by the masses and not by any politician. And I can say civil society, the religious, the academics can 
man the int the the, 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 the putting in place the, of the, uh, uh, provisional government and no active politician, no active minister, no politician of any active politician in any political party should be within that transitional government. So that a transitional government of two years, three years should be put in place so that the politicians after that can go back to the field and do their politics and get to Professor, what about the other regions hit by security tensions. We have the far north region with the Boko Haram. We have the east region with uh, rebels from the Central African Republic. Uh, and we have all the problems um, begging for peace all across the country. Yes, uh, I think it's an interesting question and that call brings me to the point uh, where we always insist that every Cameroonian, every, every human being should try to be a vector of peace. We are living in a very trying moment and uh, we don't want a further this escalation of the crisis situation of the Northwest to get to other areas. Yes, the situation in the extreme North region is rebuilding. Uh, we are talking about the Boko Haram phenomenon, and uh, we are foot soldering for peace in that area. Uh, we just realize that it is important to build peace, and we, we are not only doing it in the amphitheaters. We are actually in the field, uh, in the Northwest, in the Southwest regions, and in the far Northern region. We are currently in the field, in the Zamai area in Mokolo, trying to work with the, uh, to resolve the petty crisis uh, between the refugees, the ex-hostages, the ex-combatants, uh, the host communities, so that they can be able to live much more in concord and harmony. Uh, I think that that should be the, 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 the challenge and the call for every single Cameroonian to ask him or herself that in this crisis situation, what should they do? I think the answer is that they should be engaged in concrete actions to roll back uh, conflicts and impose, I should say, some, some social justice which will lead to, to peace. But concerning the specific case of the Boko Haram uh, problem in the far north region of the country, what's that specific thing on which government uh, should concentrate on to be able to not only push back the, uh, the militants of the terrorist sect, but to prevent young people in particular from joining the movement? Yeah, w one of the things that we, we realize in the field is that uh, most of the civil society organizations, even the government, have been focusing on the refugees who are not Cameroonians, they've been focusing on, on the ex-associates, the ex-combatants, uh, with le very little uh, attention on the host communities. And of course, the Far North region is characterized by some exaggerated poverty. And we have young people who have not been to the bushes, who have not touched the guns. But they see that those who have been directly or indirectly involved uh, in the Boko Haram uh, phenomenon have increasing and improved social and economic status. So it might provoke them to equally join Boko Haram so that they can eventually drop their guns and get back and get trained. So we are saying that it is incumbent on government and the civil societies to adopt an inclusive approach in handling the crisis and putting the host communities at the center of the peace building mechanisms in that area in order to ensure that there is inter-religious, inter-community dialogue uh, so that peace can go on and the young people should not be encouraged to be recruited into Boko Haram. Professor Willy Brot Zengua, historian, political scientist, expert in peace building and conflict management, founding president of Heritage Higher Institute for Peace and Development Studies, executive director of the African Network Against Illiteracy, Conflict and Human Rights Abuses, and NICRA, and of course, senior peace and conflict analyst and consultant for the New York based Global Center on Cooperative Security. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for getting me. I hope uh, we shared some insights. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for staying with us. That's it for this edition of The Insight. Goodbye.